Barry Franklin. I serve as the Director of Preventive Cardiology and Cardiac Rehabilitation at Beaumont Hospital, Royal Oak. I've been here for 35 years. I also serve as Professor of Internal Medicine, Oakland University, Beaumont School of Medicine. Normally, I'm talking about preventive cardiology, health, and wellness, but today I'm going to be discussing a topic that's really been a passion of mine for three or four decades. That is the characteristics of highly successful people. The topic of my talk today is called GPS for Success, Behavioral Skills, Strategies, and Secrets of Highly Successful People. For more than four decades now, I've been studying the characteristics of highly successful people, and over the next 30 or 35 minutes, I'd like to share with you some personal stories and some stories of people who have really been an inspiration in my life. As we look at highly successful people, beyond diet, beyond clothing, beyond nutrition, almost everybody wants to be somebody in life. And as we look at this slide, we see some of the most successful people in the world. What I'd like to do today is share with you a topic that is near and dear to me, and that is life aspirations and setting goals in our lives. What you see on the left side of this slide is a little boy who watched his father, a world championship weightlifter, and uh, he already aspired, uh, you can see in this slide, to be a, a world champion weightlifter as well. What you see on the right is me back in 1967 as a gymnast at Kent State University. Uh, my goals at the time were really twofold. I was interested in being able to do additional uh, uh, performances on the still rings, new tricks, uh, new devices, and, and even more important, I was interested in who I was going to take out on Saturday night. Those were my two goals or aspirations. But then I came to the sobering realization that uh, that's not going to pay the bills for the rest of your life, or it's not going to lead to a successful career. And it was that time that I became fascinated with a simple question. Why do some people and organizations really thrive and others merely survive. And after years of college education and learning about all kinds of physiology perspectives, it seemed somewhat paradoxical to me that no college course had really prepared me for the world of work. And to find out a little bit about success and successful people, I began reading everything I could on leadership and success strategies and carefully studied the stars in their respective fields. I asked myself, were there common behaviors Tiger Woods and Jim Carrey, the people like that, that they exhibited on a day-to-day -day basis. And I came to the realization that yes, leadership, professional opportunities, and career success don't just happen. You create them by demonstrating certain actions and behaviors on a regular basis. I get young people who ask me all the time, Dr. Franklin, how do I set myself apart from the crowd? I wanna get involved in a professional career and I want to be successful. What do I need to do? I think the foundations of highly successful people are really shown in this slide, and I'd highlight three points. Number one, find out what you love to do. Number two, take 100% responsibility for your life. And number three, focus on others' needs, that is serving others on a regular basis, and you'll be imminently successful. It's taken back by this quote studied this guy because, of course, he was world-renowned Steve Jobs, whose life was cut short. The only way to do great work, he said, is to love what you do. If you haven't found it, he said, keep looking. I think those words are so true. Those were echoed by Pat Williams, who at the time was senior vice president for the Orlando Magic basketball team. And when asked What's the secret of success? Pat Williams responded, figure out what you love to do, what you're good at, you love to do, and then get somebody to pay you to do that for the rest of your life. I think uh, those results are sobering. I was at Kent State many years ago, and the student came up to me and said, Dr. Franklin, do you know the 10 most powerful words in the English language, 10 most powerful two-letter words? And I said, no, I don't. And she said, the following. If it is to be, it is up to me. And I think that's so true. People who are really highly successful take 100% responsibility for their life. 
Albert Einstein, one of the century's universally acknowledged geniuses, was once asked by a reporter, Doctor, why are we here? In other words, why were we put on this earth? In his response, he looked at him in surprise as if this was not a very smart question. And he said, we're here to serve other people. I think it's so true. Making a difference and serving others. I remember vividly a quote I read years ago by the late Zig Ziglar. He said, you can get anything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. When I look at the careers of Steve Jobs, Ray Kroc, who founded McDonald's, Henry Ford, and Walt Disney. These individuals made lasting contributions that benefited millions, in some cases, billions of people uh, as a result of their livelihood. The ultimate eulogy, if you listen to the eulogies at all of their funerals, was basically this, the world's a better place because for a brief time, Steve Jobs, Ray Kroc, Henry Ford, and Walt Disney lived in it. Years ago, my wife and I, about five years ago, my wife and I were invited. Uh, I was a visiting professor in Thailand. And um, I remember telling my colleagues who took us around Thailand, um, several students and professors, that uh, we wanted to give lectures in several different cities and they were very enthusiastic. And one of the professors happened to know one of the wealthiest, most successful men in Thailand, who mentioned, would you want to meet Dr. Franklin? And uh, he said, uh, when's he coming? And he told him, and he said, unfortunately, my wife and I are going to be out of the country, but why don't you use our home? <laughs> why don't you use our servants? Why don't you spend a day or two here? You're, you're most welcome to be our guests. My wife and I uh, walked on to his uh, palatial mansion uh, saw one of the most magnificent homes and settings we had ever seen. And as the serving staff was taking us upstairs to a wood panel bedroom where we'd be spending the night, I was taken back by a sign I saw in the hallway. And that sign read, we become successful by helping other people become successful. I think it's so true. And I said to my wife, Linda, Linda, we've just traveled 23 hours to get here to find the universal secret to success. That is serving others, whether you're a tailor, whether you're a mechanic, whether you're a physician, whatever you're, whether you're a restaurateur, whatever your business, if you can successfully serve other people, you're going to become imminently successful. I look at my own career and what you see me here on the left-hand side is at 25 years of age and uh, on the right-hand side uh, a couple years ago. And um, what I'd like to do is share with you nine lessons that I learned about leadership and the road to success. And in many cases, I base my own experiences on, on experiences I've had with as a member of major professional associations, including the American College of Sports Medicine, American Heart Association, and the AACVPR, American Association of Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehab, but I also want to share with you some inspirational stories about athletes and their successes in sports, which have tremendous relevance to success in life. So let's talk about these nine lessons that I've learned. Lesson number one, eliminate perceived barriers. I remember the story of Roger Bannister. Roger Bannister was the first one ever to run a mile in less than four minutes. That's a picture of Roger, Roger Bannister finishing the, the mile in less than four minutes in England on May 6, 1954, when doctors and experts said, it's impossible, it's impossible to run a mile in less than four minutes. Roger Bannister thought otherwise. And month after month, he'd take a second off his time or a half a second the next month or two seconds the next month. And on May 6, 1954, he ran a mile in the unbelievable time of three minutes, 54 seconds, 0.4 minutes. Uh, he said, when you abandon perceived limits, amazing things happen. And he also highlighted the fact that the person who can drive himself or herself further, once the effort gets really hard, gets really painful, is ultimately the one who wins in, in, in races and in life. Lesson number two, I'm a big fan of this guy, Michael Phelps. And I remember watching the Olympics years ago, 
and Michael Phelps won the 100 meter butterfly and he beat his opponent, the second place finisher in one one hundredth of a second. And I said to myself, how in the world can anybody beat somebody by one one hundredth of a second? Then I picked up the newspaper the next day and I read this quote. Michael Phelps, when asked that question, he said, I think in my dreams, I always wanted it. And when asked by the NBC interviewer, he said, I guess believing all along I could do it goes a long way. The biggest thing I've been thankful for, he said, is I can use my imagination. When people said, oh, that's impossible. It can't be done. That's where my imagination, he said, came into play. I oftentimes showed this slide to many of my students. And I said, what matters most is how you see yourself. Lesson number three, three of the nine, persistence and tenacity pays. One of my favorite quotes, hockey legend Wayne Gretzky, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take in life, so go for it. People say, I'm thinking about taking, working on a master's degree or I'm thinking about this certification or that, my answer is go for it, make yourself better. Here's an idol uh, that, that I've had uh, since I was a kid, Michael Jordan. And this quote really got my attention where Michael Jordan said, he's missed more than 9,000 shots in his career and lost almost 300 games. On many cases, in many cases, instances, he was assigned to take the game winning shot and he missed. He said, I failed over and over in my life. That's precisely why I succeed. I think that's one of the characteristics of highly successful people. They accept setbacks, they dust themselves off and they keep moving on that road to success. Lesson number four, I got this from a fortune cookie years ago. It said, none of the secrets of success will work unless you do. You, in other words, you've got to pay the price. Steve Alford, who was an Olympic gold, me gold medalist, who actually was an NBA player and played with Michael Jordan in the Olympics, said, when I played with Michael Jordan, there was a huge gap between Michael Jordan's ability and everybody else on the team. But what impressed me most, he said, was that Michael Jordan, the superstar, was always the first one on the floor and the last one to leave. I read an article the other night by, on, about Kobe Bryant. I never realized this. Kobe Bryant, another superstar, the late Kobe Bryant, he was at practice and on the floor three hours before any of the other players on the team, invariably. This brings up, I guess, what I refer to as the 10,000 hour rule, but it's not really my rule. It was first put forth by a guy by the name of Malcolm Gladwell in, in the book Outliers, who studied highly successful people. And what Michael, uh, Malcolm Gladwell said is that to be successful in anything, you need to put 10,000 hours of work into it. Gladwell goes on to discuss professional athletes, businessmen like Bill Gates, and musicians like the Beatles. They all prepared for this success. They prepared, prepared, prepared. I was taken back when I read a story of Bill Gates, whose father was a wealthy lawyer who sent him to the University of Washington. And Bill was interested in computers and computer programming, and the University of Washington had one of the few computers. And he found out that the university nearby had one of the largest computers in the world at the time, very huge, and that was available for students and others to use, but only available from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. Whether you realize it or not, Bill Gates got up every morning at, at 1.30 in the morning, set his clock, walked to the, to the nearby university, and programmed for four hours, and early on, he did that countless evenings, and along with the computer programming he did through the university, through, through his own uh, entrepreneurial uh, endeavors, Bill Gates, at a very early age, was able to accomplish more than 10,000 hours of experience in computer programming, which led to his ultimate success. What you see here are three very famous golfers. On the left, Gary Player. Uh, who's still alive in his 80s today, still playing some professional golf. In the middle, Arnold Palmer, and to the far right, Sam Snead. Great story on Gary Player. Gary Player was once walking through an airport, 
And a guy looks at him and he says, aren't you Gary Player, the famous golfer? And uh, Gary Player responds, yes, I'm Gary Player in South Africa. And the guy looks at him and says, wow, Mr. Player, I've watched you on television for years. I'd do anything to hit a golf ball like you. Gary Player, who's normally a diplomat, responded, no, you wouldn't. And the guy kind of looked at him strangely. And Gary Player said, you know what you got to do to hit a golf ball like me? You got to get up every day at 4.30 in the morning Go to the driving range and hit a thousand balls or two thousand balls until you can hardly hold the club. Go back to the clubhouse, put some ice on your hands, go back, have a glass of juice or a cup of coffee, a piece of toast, go back and hit another thousand balls, then go out and play 18, 27, or 36 holes. You do anything to hit a golf ball like me if you don't have to practice. That's what you got to do to hit a golf ball like me. Most people who do things really well, people think they're gifted. Most people who do things really well have put countless hours, far more than 10,000 hours, into their craft. Lesson number five, highly successful people. It pays to be just a little bit better. 2002, I started documenting the top 10 PGA players, Professional Golf Association players, their average score. Look at this slide. Number one golfer that year was Tiger Woods. He averaged 68.56 shots. The number 10 golfer that year was Sergio Garcia. He averaged 70 shots. Think about that. What does that mean? What that means is that on average, every time they played a professional round of golf, Tiger Woods would beat Sergio Garcia by less than 1.5 shots. What does that mean? That difference led Tiger Woods that year to be the number one golfer in the world. His income was $6.9 million. In contrast, Sergio Garcia, the 10th best golfer in the world, was 70. He earned $2.4 million. But a company in 2002, you may have heard the name, Nike, decided we're going to award our top golfer in the world this year a marketing contract for $60 to $80 million. Who got it? Tiger Woods. The moral of this story is it pays to be just a little bit better in anything that you can do. So I tell people, if you can get some additional training, additional experience, an additional degree, uh, taking an additional course, all those things, small differences in life can make a big difference in your payday. I love this analogy, it pertains to baseball. The difference between an outstanding player and an average player is one hit out of 20. Player who bats 250 may make 500,000 a year, uh, gets five hits every 20 times at bat, but the 300 hitter who may make $3 million or $5 million gets a year gets six hits out of those same 20 times at bats. It takes a little bit of extra performance to go from good to great. So anything people can do, extra for a baseball player, extra, extra time in the batting cage, a conditioning program, improved strength, reaction time, uh, flexibility, all those things can make a small difference in performance and a big difference in payday. Lesson number six, I was a gymnast in college, so I was particularly interested in studying Peter Vidmar, and I watched him in the Olympics years ago, an Olympic gold medalist, and he was asked the question, how did you achieve Olympic success? And his answer was a very simple answer. To be a champion, I had to do just two things. Work out when I wanted to and work out when I didn't. That's essentially what we call discipline or focus. And it involves sacrifice. People who are highly successful have discipline, focus, and are willing to sacrifice to get there. Lesson number seven. Give people more than they expect. I read a fascinating article years ago about a New York cab driver who makes in Manhattan, who makes $40,000 a year more in tips than every other cabbie. The question is, how does he make such great tips? It's very simple. He exceeds his customers' expectations. It's his cab. He offers a choice of music. He buys copies of the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, and when his customers go into the cab, he said, please feel free to take a paper on me. He offers cold drinks and sometimes even fresh fruit. In hectic 
brusque Manhattan, his acts of decency make him stand out. Give people, people who are very successful invariably exceed people's expectations. Great story. I was on a Northwest Airlines flight many years ago. Of course, Northwest was bought by, by Delta. But this is a book that I had written with a good friend and colleague. His name is Joe Piscatella. We had just written this book, and I had a couple of copies of this book in my briefcase. I sat down, and I was flying a lot, so at the time they put me in business class, and I was disappointed because they're closing the door and there's nobody next to me. I always like to sit and talk to somebody who's next to me. And uh, all of a sudden, as they're closing the door, this big guy comes in, big shoulders, small waist, well-dressed, maybe 35, and he sits down next to me. True story. I look at him, and I see this huge ring on this guy's hand. And I'm thinking, am I sitting next to a Super Bowl player? And I don't know who the heck this guy is. So I said, you look like a professional athlete, are you? And he said, no, I... I uh, I said, geez, you look like it. He's, I used to play amateur hockey in Canada. I said, what do you do now? He said, I'm the vice president of Northwest Airlines. I said, wow. He said, what do you do? I said, I just run a cardiac rehab program at Beaumont Hospital in Royal Oak. And he paused and he looked at me and he said, you know, my dad just had a heart attack about, about a month ago. And he's trying to learn about cholesterol and what he needs to do. I didn't think twice. I opened up my briefcase and I gave him a copy and I said, I just wrote this book, give it to your dad. And he leaned over and he said, what do I owe you? I said, you don't owe me anything, just give the book to your dad. And um, he said, well, thanks very much, Dr. Franklin. I really appreciate it. And uh, we're flying and he says to me, uh, what do you, Dr. Franklin, what do you think of Northwest Airlines? I'd be interested in your thoughts. And I said, I think you guys are great. I fly you all the time, but I have one complaint. He said, what's that? And I said, um, whenever I call Northwest Helpline and I want to, I'm going overseas and I want to upgrade using frequent flyer miles to business class, there's never a seat. He looks at me, he starts laughing again. So there's almost always a seat. And I said, not when Barry Franklin calls the Northwest Airlines. And he paused for a second and he reached in his pocket and he pulled out a card. And he said, it's very nice of you to give me that book for my dad. I appreciate it. Here's my card. My name's Jeff. In the future, when you want to go overseas and you want to upgrade to business class, you call me directly. I must have used his um, th this contact five or six times, uh, and the book cost me $6. Exceed people's expectations routinely, whether you're a customer, whether they're a client or whatever, and good things happen to you. Lesson number eight. It's a great story. Always strive for greater rewards. Olympic athletes always go for the gold, and I tell my students and younger colleagues, you should too. It's a great story about a high school teacher. It's given the final exam, as you see in that slide, the last day there were about 30, all, all male students in this particular class, 30 students, and uh, he was getting ready to give the, the exam. And he said, you know, you've been a really good class. I know many of you going to college, so grades matter. And um, I'm gonna do something I've never done. He said, I'm gonna, if you're interested, I'll give you an automatic B on the final, which means you could still get an A in the course if you've done very, very well. Give you an automatic B on the final will save you a couple hours worth of work. Well, of the 30 students, 26 got up and left and said, wow, this guy's great. He's a terrific teacher. He's gonna let us, he's gonna give us a B on the final. We'll have to take it. Four students remained. And uh, he walked around to those four students and he said, uh, so you guys want to take the final? And they said, yeah. Well, in fact, one guy said, I stayed hard for this. I think I could be B to B, to tell you the truth. And then he paused for a second and he pulled out the final exam, which was one page. And that page said, congratulations. You've just received an A in this class. Keep believing in yourself. I tell all the students I work with, all the younger colleagues, go for the gold. Don't settle for the B. Lesson number nine. It's a great story. Picture this. There's five penguins 
sitting on a big iceberg, looking at beautiful blue water, and the, the day is magnificent. And the first penguin says to the second, wow, I think this looks like a perfect day to go in for a swim. And the second one says, yeah, I've never seen such beautiful conditions. The water's crystal clear. And the third one said, well, if you guys go in uh, swimming later on, I think I'll go with you. And the fourth one said, yeah, I am just amazed. I can't remember such a beautiful day. I'll bet that water would be so refreshing. What was the fifth penguin that got my attention? What are you saying? Hell, I'm going in. Too many people are like those four penguins sitting on that iceberg saying, well, maybe I'll do this, maybe I'll do that. The person who takes action is invariably the one who's rewarded. It's an enduring axiom of success that says the universe rewards action, yet as simple as this is, many people get bogged down analyzing planning when all they really need to do is take action. Look at the word satisfaction, a key component in satisfaction in life. To achieve satisfaction is to take action. Sometimes I'll stand at the Oakland University Medical School and stand in front of the students, especially a new class, and hold up a copy of a book I've written and I'll say, um, who would like a copy of this? Usually it's the first day. And usually a medical student will say, um, is it for free? And I'll say, yeah, it's, the book's for free. And people raise their hands and everybody's raising their hands. And I said, here for the taking, who would like it? People are leaning forward, I'll take it, I'll take it. And then finally somebody gets up and they walk to the podium. The guy walks to the podium, what's your name? Eric. <laughs> What did Eric do that nobody else did? He got off his butt and moved in the direction of something he wanted. The universe rewards action. Something else that's important for achieving success is to take action by promoting yourself, your ideas, your staff, your service line, your products and businesses. This slide illustrates the fact, and I firmly believe it, that the more visibility you have or your hospital has or your TV station has, the more opportunities come about. And if you're an individual being involved in association, presenting, publishing, fine. But once you start getting on television, radio, newspapers, you reach what I call the visibility threshold where people start calling you because they saw you and, and want you to be involved in something. Sometimes when that visibility goes from tens to hundreds to thousands to millions, a percentage of those people are going to say, hey, I want that guy. I want that guy to do something for us. So visibility leads to opportunities. The more visibility you have, the more opportunities. This is a very famous quote from Tommy Hopkins. He calls it the law of Goya. Get off your butt. Uh, it's a law that's very simple. And uh, he's one of the top salespeople in the world today, and he trains salespeople. And he says, just be in action. Every day, take steps that move you actively toward your goals and dreams. Or as the Nike commercial says, just do it. Some final thoughts. What do I want to leave you with today? If you ask chief executives of major companies, what do you look for when you hire people? I will tell you, because I study this, they'll tell you the number one criteria I look for is not their college, not what they look like, not how they're dressed, their ability to work with other people. Number one is what CEOs of major companies look for. I love this quote. If you're in a management position, don't tell people, show them. You teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. You can preach a better sermon with your actions than with your lips. My orientation to Beaumont 30 years ago, I remember walking down the hall at the Troy Hospital and seeing a well-dressed guy in a suit. And as he was walking down the hall, he was picking up papers. And I said to the doctor with me, who's, who's the guy in the suit picking up papers? And he said, uh, that's Mr. Michalski. He's a new assistant administrator. Long story short, Gene Michalski ended up being president and CEO of Beaumont Hospital years ago. Uh, he did very, very well, highly successful career, well-paid, wonderful bonus package when he retired. But my first impression, Mr. Michalski was seeing a young guy in a suit walking down the hallway, picking up papers, 
at the Beaumont Troy Hospital. It's a habit, by the way, I picked up ever since I watched Gene that day. Wonders of praise. If you work with other people, praise them. People oftentimes leave jobs or feel unsatisfied because they feel nobody appreciates their work. Mother Teresa said, people around us are starving for appreciation and acknowledgement. We have the ability to give them that gift on a regular basis. These two ladies may look familiar. Diane Sawyer and Katie Cork. I, um, I've admired both their work, but I remember coming home years ago and turning the television on and Diane Sawyer, who you see right in the middle there, was being asked by a, new, by a reporter um, the following question. She said, Diane, what do you think of the negative comments that Katie Couric had to say about you? Well, by this time, I'm riveted to the television because I think they're both great. And I'm wondering how she, she's going to respond. And she paused for maybe 20, 30 seconds. And, and she said, well, what, what do you mean? Uh, what did she say? And she said, uh, the interviewer said, well, Katie Couric said, you're not a very good interviewer. You never challenge the people you're interviewing and that your, your, your interviews are rather ball, uh, dull and, and, and sterile. And uh, by this time, I'm locked in the television because I want to see what Diane Sawyer is going to say. She paused another 20 seconds or so. And then she said the following. I never heard the comment you're saying that Katie Couric had to say about me. It certainly doesn't sound like anything that Katie Couric would say about me. Do I have a comment? Yeah. I think Katie Couric is one of the most talented people in news media today. I've always respected and admired her work. That's my comment. That's a class act. Highly successful people are class acts. I was also taken back as I wrap this talk up with this habit of empire builder David Ogilvie, who when he had a new employee, he gave that new employee a gift of six wooden dolls, each within the other, one smaller than the next, one inside the other. And when the recipient got to the final doll, the smallest doll, and opens it up, he or she would find this message. It says, if we hire people who are smaller than we are, will become a company of diminishing stature. But if we hire people who we think are actually smarter, better, more talented than we are, we shall become a thriving company of giants. I think it's so true. Whenever we hire people, we try to find people who have unique skills and we try to reward those people. Leaders, really great leaders, bring out the best in all around them. Sometimes one person, by virtue of their actions, interactions, brings out the best in all around them. I, I'm, I think of the, the example, uh, the player shared by the Miami Heat and Cleveland Cavaliers, both of which who won world titles, both of which who had this guy, LeBron James, on their team. LeBron James clearly took some mediocre players for both Miami and average to mediocre players from Cleveland and took their games up three, four notches. How do you do it? By leading by example, by showing other players what a real strong work ethic is, by showing players the importance of teamwork rather than one superstar. I also tell young people when the boss standing at a meeting. In this case, you see the lady straight in front of you standing at the end of the table. And the boss says, I need a volunteer. The people that move up in those corporations, people that routinely do more than they're paid to do, raise their hand often uh, when they're asked for volunteers. If you, in fact, watch this guy at the far right with his finger to his mouth right now, when she asked for the volunteer, this is what he did very, very quickly, raised his hand. Those are the people who invariably move up in a corporation or an organization. And I think one of the last things I'd share with you is that most of the rich, famous, super successful people that I've studied give back big time, whether it's Oprah Winfrey, Jack Canfield, uh, Jim Carrey, the actor, 
they help other people. They establish charitable foundations. They invest their time and effort at no, no money. They've come to the sobering realization that giving back to others invariably leads to good karma. I love this quote. The domino effect starts with you. A candle is not diminished by giving another candle light. So if you can help a young person with their career, uh, it has tremendous benefits for not only them, but yourself. Great personal story I'll share with you. I was an undergraduate student at Kent State and heard a very famous cardiologist many, many years ago at our university. I read a number of his papers, Dr. Herman K. Hellerstein, and um, I was enthralled by how successful this guy was. I was at Kent State, he was at Case Western Reserve in Cleveland, Ohio, and I decided one day naively at 19 years of age, I'm gonna to drive to Case Western Reserve and see if I can sit down and talk with Dr. Hellerstein after seeing him lecture at Kent State University. I drove an hour and a half, two hours to get there, and I walked into the medical school, and I walked in to see what floor he was on, and walked upstairs, and walked into his office. And there, as I walked in, a lady who looked very much like the Wicked Witch of the West looked at me and she said, can I help you? And I said, yes, um, I'm looking for Dr. Hellerstein. And she said, uh, who are you? I said, uh, I'm Barry Franklin. And she paused and she said, um, do you have an appointment? And I said, no, I don't have an appointment, but I'm a big fan of Dr. Hellerstein's. I just drove two hours and um, I'd love to be able to, to meet with him and talk about my career at 19 years of age. And remember, she looked at me and she said something to the effect that, young man, you can't see the great and powerful Wizard of Oz without an appointment. And I said, I can't see him. And she said, no, he's seen patients all day. So I turned around dejected and I'm walking down the hallway and I see this guy, white hair, white lab coat. And I said, heck, before I leave the medical school, I'm going to go up to him and at least introduce myself. And I did. And I said, Dr. Hellerstein, I heard you at Kent State a, a few months ago and loved your talk. And I've read a lot of your papers. I uh, was hoping to see you for some career advice. But your secretary, Mrs. Husselman, whose pretty close picture is on the bottom left hand the side of this slide, said you're busy with patients all day. And he said to me, you drove two hours from Kent to to meet with me? And I said, yeah, but I, 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 I didn't make an appointment. He said, come on to my office. He spent an hour of that day with me and changed my life. And I vowed if I ever got successful, like if I got a bachelor's degree or a master's degree and a student said, you have time for a question, I'd make time for a question because that meeting, that chance meeting changed my life and my career direction. And ultimately, ironically, Eight years later, I'd have a PhD from Penn State University, and my second job was working with Dr. Herman K. Hellerstein. What goes around comes around. In closing, I was given a talk several years ago at a major sports medicine meeting on success strategies to young students, something very similar to what I'm covering today. And a lady comes up afterward, and she said, oh, I love that talk. Can you do our commencement in June? I said, you want me to do a commencement address? And she introduced herself, Dean Charlotte Tate, Toby Tate. And I said, um, what's the date? And she gave me the date and I said, geez, I'm free that day. Sure. I said, how many people? She said 3,000. I said, wow, I've never talked before 3,000 people. She said, you'd probably enjoy it. You'd have to wear a cap and gown and all this. I said, count on me. I'm delighted to do it. Well, I came home, that's my wife on the left, and told my wife, Linda, I said, um, Linda, I was invited to do the commencement address at the University of Illinois. In our house, Linda's the business person. I'd give away the farm. So Linda naturally asked, uh, are you being paid for the talk? And I replied, no, I didn't ask. And her response, not another volunteer job, my wife responded. Well, the bottom line is this, I went there and about a month before the dean calls and says, Dr. Franklin, would you like to bring your wife, Linda? And I said, let me ask her. She said, we'll pay their way. We'll put you up in a hotel, take you out to dinner. So we did. 
and it was a wonderful experience um, at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, they treated us like royalty. We were in a five-star hotel. It was just spectacular. I gave the talk, and I remember flying back the next day with my wife, and I was all smiles because I said, boy, this was, a, this was certainly a nice weekend. And uh, my wife said, yeah, they really treated us royally, but you still should have gotten paid something for the, for the talk. And I said, well, let's forget about it. We were treated like royalty. All of our expenses were paid. It was great. Literally three, four weeks later, I called my wife over the noon hour. And I said, Linda, what's going on? And she said, oh, I'm just bringing the mail in. And I said, oh, OK anything special? And she said, yeah, there's a, a, a letter from the dean's office at the University of Illinois, Chicago. I said, open it up. And she's walking in the door. She said, I said, it's probably a thank you note. All of a sudden, there's silence at the other end of the phone. I said, Lynn, are you still there? Are you there, Lynn? Lynn? And she sheepishly replied, Dean Tate's my new best friend. Uh, yes, there is a thank you note here, but there's a check for $3,000. Did you know that? The fact of the matter is, I didn't know that. And that's the point. That's the point I tell young people. Don't do stuff predicated on getting uh, an extra check or a bonus, whatever. Do things, do things right for people, and good things happen to you. So to conclude, when I tell young people, you know, what are the keys to building a great career? It's investing time, effort, and hard work into things that matter. Building a successful career is not a matter of circumstance or chance, but of choice. Number one, love what you do. Number two, take 100% responsibility for your life. In other words, don't blame the teacher or the boss or whatever. You got to find a way to get to where you want to go. Focus not on the rewards in life, but on the contributions, your contributions. I tell young people, write your goals down and think about them constantly. Embrace Focus and discipline to achieve your goals. Abandon perceived limitations, just like Roger Bannister. All the people said, it's impossible to run a mile in four, less than four minutes. Roger Bannister thought otherwise. Take action, get off your butt and move in the direction of your goals. Know that setbacks line the road to success and persistence pays. I think of Michael Jordan who said, he's been trusted to take the game winning shot 26 times and I, I missed. It's exactly why I succeed. Exceed people's expectations. Prepare for success. You want to be really good at something. You've got to devote more than 10,000 hours to it. Strive for constant improvement. I gave you the analogy of Tiger Woods and Sergio Garcia, 2002. Just being a little bit better in life has huge paybacks. Develop excellent people and communication skills. Go for the gold. The high school's story is most memorable. Uh, for those who walked out and the remaining four were awarded an A in the course. And lastly, generously give back, uh, even if you don't get any money for it. You never know. I love the, uh, the quote by the famous coach of, the, of uh, the Green Bay Packers, Vince Lombardi, the late Vince Lombardi, when he said, if you'll not settle for anything less than your best, you'd be amazed what you can accomplish in your life. Great closing, closing line, carpe diem, seize the day, make your lives extraordinary. Once again, I'm Barry Franklin. I serve as the Director of Preventive Cardiology and Cardiac Rehab at Beaumont Hospital Royal Oak. Uh, in my eyes, one of the top medical centers uh, in the country. Um, I also teach in the medical school and love working with young students I've tried to highlight the fact that one of my passions for many, many years is examining the behavioral characteristics of highly successful people. Um, to that end, in fact, for many years, I taught a course called GPS for Success uh, at Central Michigan University and loved the feedback that I got from students. In fact, several students said this was the most meaningful course I've ever had. Um, I'm currently working on a book called GPS for Success, Behavioral Skills, Strategies, and Secrets of Highly Successful People that I hope will be helpful to young people entering the workforce, finishing college or finishing high school at that time. Um, if people want to reach me, they can reach me at, uh, via email at barry, B-A-R-R-Y dot Franklin, F-R-A-N-K-L-I-N 
at beaumont.edu. And uh, I will try, as Dr. Herman Hellerstein helped me uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, if I can help you with uh, career directions or answering questions, I'd be glad to do so. Thanks so much for listening.